everybody. We're here at Deland. This is Deland number two, and it's 2017, and we're just starting to get some airplanes in. That's because the show doesn't open until tomorrow. So we got an early first crack here at an airplane that's right behind me, but let me put this in context for you. We have 143 models of aircraft in the LSA space. This is special light sport aircraft, all fully approved by FAA and ready to be sold as fully built aircraft. Out of 143 models, there's a lot of choices. That's good news. The, the tough news is, well, how do you pick the right one then with that huge diversity? And I'm gonna tell you right off the bat that this Harmony LSA is an airplane for general aviation guys. If you've been flying Cessnas, Pipers, Bonanzas, Cirruses, Diamonds, etc., those kind of airplanes, type certified airplanes, this one may meet your needs as well as any you'll find. It's solid. It feels like a GA airplane. It's comfortable inside. The control movements and the stick use, although it's a joystick, not a yoke, feels like a GA pilot will expect it to feel. So I mentioned this is the, uh, the Harmony LSA. This whole game started with the Vector with the Sports Star. And in fact, Sports Star has a distinction it will never, ever lose. It was the first airplane to win FAA acceptance back in April, early April of 2005, number one. It can, that can never change. Nobody can ever get ahead of them. However, while they evolved the Sports Star very nicely through a series of changes, and we've got video and I've written about that as well, but eventually they came to the realization that for the American market, which has a large number of general aviation pilots flying those T-seat airplanes we just talked about, the Harmony was aimed directly at them with a number of changes to it that are significant. So I started to say that it's an all-metal airplane, that sticks. What's up front here under the hood is a Rotax 912 ULS. That's the carbureted 100 horsepower model. Of course, the newer ones now are coming out with a 912 IS, the fuel injected electronically controlled engine. And that gets some wonderful uh, fuel burns and a little higher performance. That's what it was made to do. The 912 IS Sport in particular, all those words are needed to describe the latest edition of that engine. Swinging a a warp drive prop on the front, a three blade warp drive prop. Uh, all metal wings as well. The wings, as I look down the wing here, if the camera can follow with me, uh, this is straight along here and then right at this junction here, it tapers back and then tapers again at the wing tip. So it's a compound or double taper wing. And when they did that, um, they were able to shorten the wing a little bit, but they also increased the size of the aileron, which I'm gonna go around here in the back and I'm gonna move up for you just a little bit. Uh, so you can see how big that aileron is. It's 25% larger than the one they used earlier. Now, you can't see the flaps from here, but they are the kind of split flaps. That means the top part of the wing does not change. That smoothness there stays like that. The flap just comes down from the bottom, and it really comes down 15 degrees, 30 degrees, 50, 50 degrees. And when he does that, well, I noticed that I didn't notice them going down so much, but when they pulled the... Uh, when Steve pulled the flaps back up from 50 to 30, I could feel the aircraft accelerate forward. So clearly these are working good. And you notice VG strips all the way down the leading edge of the wing. This is one of those funny things in aviation. It makes the air less smooth, which you'd think you wouldn't want on the front of a wing, but for those that, many of you know this already, for those that don't know it, the VGs, by turbulating the air, by making it a little bit rougher, make it adhere to the wing better. Okay, so that describes the basics of the airplane. Right up front here, you can see it's got a parachute installation done very nicely. I used to do a lot with parachutes. I know what's a good installation. This is a good one. The straps that hold the fuselage go down here, and even those taper very nicely. They continue on past that point, but the little bit of extra room they need here, it just works out beautifully. Great big canopy on it, and the canopy is, is, is just a very solid thing. This is true about everything. Everything I can say about the airplane is this is just feels solid, behaves solid when you do it. So the canopy goes up very high, latches in the back, very solid latching, it catches right away. Uh, you almost can't not get the um, canopy down correctly. Looking here, the camera can see the seats a little bit, and while we're looking at that way, and I just mentioned the canopy, these seats may look a little bit low to you. And indeed, they were a little low on my back, uh, perhaps down about where my hand is reaching there. I kind of like that, because I could, 
I could relax back a little bit like this and stretch my shoulders a bit. For those that want more support, there's one that comes up about three or four inches from that, and there's another one that comes up all the way like in a car with a full headrest built into it and everything. So you can have any of those you want. So 912 uh, ULS engine typically burns uh, between four and six gallons. Six gallons would really be pushing it hard. Four gallons would be backed off or just loitering around doing a little sightseeing. So let's call it five just to have a round number. Uh, right underneath my hand here is the left fuel tank. There's one on the other side. Looks obviously the same way. Holds 15.85 gallons is what's labeled. Let's call it 16. So times two, 32 gallons. I said about five gallons an hour, and you won't burn that much typically on a, on a long cruise, so you can do the math easily. There's more than six hours of flying, uh, even with some reserve, and honestly, I can't stay in an airplane that long. I don't want to be in it that long, but it saves you from possibly having to buy gas from a resource you're not certain of, or just saves you from having to buy it at a higher price at some other airport. So a fixed gear on the main gear, but the nose wheel is also a fared wheel and that is a fully steerable nose wheel, uh, pedals on both sides, brakes on both sides, joystick on both sides, so either seat can do all the controls. One reason why this airplane has been popular in flight schools, because of those kinds of features. But the steering on it, it's very solid and the brakes were very strong. I was pleased with those, both of those qualities and that kind of shares uh, some facts with the wing controls. Uh, and the joystick, the left-right controls and the fore-aft controls are all push rod so that they are very solid feeling. There is no slop in those stick, uh, not at all that I could discern. Rudder pedals is by cables, but the rudder pedals were also surprisingly smooth. So we're going to show you how you get in the airplane. And because Steve Minnick from Dreams Come True, this is Steve, Dreams Come True is one of the two Air Vector distributors in the USA, along with AB Flight and Art Tarola. Steve's going to show us the entry because he's a less clumsy guy than I am about this. So kind of describe what you're doing here, and I'll follow along. He's going to put his hand right there where it says handhold. That's a nice sturdy construction, by the way. One foot up on the uh, non-skid area, forward of the place where it says don't step there, by the way. And now he's going to put a hand up here on the forward there's a little grip up here. You can't see it in the camera, but it's there. And, and that's also very solid. I keep saying that about this airplane. Now he's on the rear bulk of the uh, bulkhead of the seats where he's got another solid place to put it. And then without having to put his feet on the seats, which some people don't like to do, and I appreciate that, and lower yourself down. The exit process is a little bit different than that now. If you want to do that for us right away again here, he's going to use this part, which again, very solid. You don't feel like you're sitting on a razor blade and it doesn't feel like anything's going to give. Wiggle his left foot out, his right foot out, and just kind of go around the other way and back down and off. So it's a fairly easy airplane to get in and out of. And again, you've heard me say the word solid how many times now? That's because that's the way this airplane feels. You know, I'm sitting in the flight instructor seat and there's some flight instructors who say, this is my office. Well, I'm telling you, if this was your office, you'd be a happy camper. We're inside the Evector Harmony LSA now. And it, uh, there's a number of things I want to say about it, but let me start off with just the seat and the seat comfort. The seat cushions, that is the flat part that you, your rear end and your legs rest on, of course, comes up well forward, almost to the knee, a little bit shy of the knee. There's some that go even further. Very comfortable seat position. I didn't, I don't feel a lot of lumbar support in here, but I often complain about airplanes that don't have that, and yet this one felt very good to me. We flew about 45 minutes, no issues whatsoever, very comfortable. Uh, most people would find this a comfortable airplane to be in all the time. Remember, you can have seats that are this high, about that high, or ones that come up all the way to the back of your head. So those are choices you can have, much like you can have choices in the panel too. Now what you're seeing here may look kind of like smaller screened, flat screens, and indeed they are. This, is, this airplane's a few years old. It's got 700 hours on it, although to look at it, you'd be hard pressed to acknowledge that it has that much time on it. Uh, but these are the TL Electronics from the Czech Republic, and in fact, for the American market, Dreams Come True and AB Flight are using only Garmin G3X Touch and Dynon Skyview Touch, both of which make some marvelous instruments with larger screens. So clearly the setup you see here would be slightly different with those big screens, but all the performance in the world. As you see on the extreme left here, there's an airspeed indicator in analog form, and on the extreme right here, there's a, uh, an altimeter in analog form. Now, that and a few other analog instruments that meet technical standard order, or TSO, allow you can fly this airplane in instrument conditions then, with the right credentials, with the right training, with the right 
other things that you need to make sure you're doing it correctly, but it can be done is the point, and these folks can advise you about it. Whole row of uh, switches down here, very nicely arranged. Uh, these are all your circuit breakers and so forth. Uh, Becker radio and Becker transponder right here, uh, intercom up there. Right here in the center, something I always love right in front of my hand is the vernier control throttle. This is, if for those that don't know what these are, you're going to want one someday. And if you push this button in, you can shove the, th the throttle in just like you would on any push throttle. But you can also just twist it like I'm doing here with no effort at all, and it's a very fine, precise motion. Throttles in airplanes want to be moved slowly and precisely, and this is the right way to do it. It does have a lock on it there you can put on if you need it. Down below this, you see some air controls down here. This is below the red parachute handle. I'm always glad when there's a parachute in it. It's an option in this airplane. Some people want them, some people don't. I'm one who loves them. I have a little bias. I used to work in that industry, so I think they're really well, money well spent. And you have the weight capacity and other things. I would say get it, but that's, of course, a personal decision for you. Below that, we have an indicator on the um, uh, aileron trim and on the nose trim. And then below that, we have some air controls letting air in, including one that lets a little bit of air into the cockpit. You can see perhaps up here this little black um, little black thing that I'm pointing at. That's just a little seal, a weather seal. And that brings in a, it's a very small amount of air. You can barely feel it, but in a condition where there's moisture in the air and it's cool, the inside canopy can fog up a little bit, that'll take care of it. That's a push rod right down here. So there are your air controls. Um, over on the side here where I've got my hand, that is a little um, uh, uh, air inlet with some NACA ports on the outside, let in a lot of air. You can aim that to some extent, not very widely, but somewhat, and you can increase by twisting it, you can increase the volume of air coming in and I felt very comfortable in it, but it wasn't a particularly stifling hot day today, thank goodness. Um, so then uh, the last thing to say about the seats is they do not adjust. They are fixed in position, but underneath the panel, and now not on this particular older airplane, but on the brand new ones, there's a position right here and one on the other side as well. You pull that back and then the rudder pedals will spring load. They'll spring load towards you and you push them away and then let go of the handle and they'll lock into that position. It will adjust over about a six inch range, so that should, by my calculation, handle someone about my height, 5'9", very easily, up to say 6'3", 6 6'4", 6 uh, and you would fit inside. When I uh, felt for the uh, canopy, it was a good five or six inches above the top of my head, which had a, a headset on it, so that translates to you know maybe another half an inch or so. Plenty of room in here for at least an average side person. Full eight inches wider than a Cessna 172. Very comfortable inside. Finally, a couple little last minute things here. I don't know if you can see it very well, but I'm putting my hand in a map pocket right here. And you know what else you have to have on a vehicle these days? Cup holders, and it's got one on each side. So you can put a water bottle, stays put, doesn't roll around on the floor, doesn't get down in the rudder pedals, which would be a bad thing. So it's good to have that there, even if it seems uh, like something that's not absolutely essential, but it doesn't add hardly any weight. Uh, as you see, I'm, I'm reaching back. You can probably see my hand through the window a little bit there. It's a long way back there. There's a hat rack back here that I'm kind of pounding on. That may be what you hear in the background. And then this one goes down here. You could put a couple of pretty good sized luggage pieces in there. And you can put, assuming weight and balance is uh, accommodating, and you need to do a weight and balance check, but you can put 55 pounds of weight back there, which is more than enough for the average travel in an airplane of this kind. How does she perform? Well, takeoff roll book says about 400 feet for takeoff. Certainly we got off the ground quick. I don't have any way to verify that independently without going out and measuring or something, but we were off the ground quickly and we were climbing rapidly. So we took off, left the ground 400 feet, climbing out about 70 knots, and that was showing about 1,000 feet a minute climb rate at about 5,300 RPM. In all cases, I never saw engine heat oil pressure, oil temperature, or exhaust gas temperatures get anywhere out of where they should be. Um, they are clearly, the cowling arrangement and the way they've got airflow through the engine working very, very well for them. So we climbed out. Uh, we got up to altitude. We only got to about 3,000 feet, and we're about sea level. So you're still fairly low in all these numbers. But as we, uh, as Steve, I let Steve do all of this, and I just observed, uh, we got up to about 106 knots indicated, 109 or so uh, GPS. And again, it'll go a little bit faster with the 912 IS engine and with the right prop on it, you're going to see the very near the 120 knot limit of the airplane. 
Then what surprised me, I, I knew it went pretty fast, but what surprised me, I've forgotten how slow it can get uh, with uh, no flaps down, but with backing it off and entering a slow flight, we were down into the 40 knot range. And when we added 15 and then 30 degrees of flaps, got it down to below 30, uh, about 35 knots. And at which speed the airplane, of course it doesn't respond as quick then, but it was felt very solid again. That word just keeps coming up and it expressed that very, very well. Um, when we did stalls, a stall warning comes on and it comes on fairly soon. It comes on at about 50 knots. So you're gonna get the stall warning. If I'm critical about anything, it may be that the stall comes on and it's not obnoxious enough that after a few minutes of having the stall continuously on, I kind of began to ignore the sound. However, when we got near stall, the airplane started to shake and buckle a little bit. The airflow over the wings is turbulating and over the tail then you're feeling it. There were multiple indications that you were near stall, not the least of which was the nose was getting high. Um, but I'd kind of forgotten about the stall warning, even though it was still going off. So you get those dual indications, it's very good. But even when it broke, at a slow entry, it, it never did. Steve had to stick all the way back as far as it could go and no real changes there. So uh, the airplane just was very well behaved. Um, we, we sped it up a little bit and entered the stall a little more aggressively. And there got to be, it was, it was a momentary break and the right wing dipped just a little bit. Characteristics are so little, but on that second practice, the deck angle is up so high, I don't know how you could not realize uh, that you were getting near stall, but there were the other indications. The stall warnings going off, the stick shake, or the, the airplane shake a little bit was going on. Uh, There's every indication that it was going to stall, and it's the slightest relaxation of the con relaxing of the controls. We're back flying again. So. Okay, after I handled the controls for a little while, I did steep turns, I did turns across the road, um, I did some maneuvering, I did my Dutch rolls, like I told you, and again, I just have nothing but good news to say about the handling characteristics. Very predictable, very easy, um, nothing to dislike about that. But I handed those controls back to Steve and said, show me how you do it in landing and talk me through it. So as we came in and maneuvered and got in uh, approach, I said one thing we hadn't looked at was the 50 degrees down flaps. That's five zero down flaps, and I wanted to experience that. So I asked Steve if he would deliberately set up high so that we could use that. He did, and 15 degrees, you notice it. Uh, there's more lift than drag at 15. At 30, there's getting to be more drag than lift, and you can kind of feel it decelerate a little bit. When the 50 came on, I didn't feel any more deceleration, but when he got rid of that, the airplane clearly accelerated forward a little bit. So 50 degrees down is a mighty short field landing, and you probably wouldn't use that in most cases. You do use 15 to take off. You do normally use 30 to put down. But I said, well, if you didn't put any flaps down at all, how are the landing characteristics? Still very straightforward and simple. Of course, you're going to have a little longer run, and uh, uh, you're going to have a little more precision needed in the timing of flare to touch down the wheels very smoothly. 30 degrees would be the desired position. And the landing roll is about 500 feet, according to book values at that point. Very straightforward. Steve did a great job, set it down very smoothly, held the nose wheel off the ground for an extended period of time, which is good. Nose wheels aren't as stoutly built as the main gear, and that's exactly what you should do and I did it very well. So a nice experience overall at flying the Vector Harmony LSA. Surely you got more questions and there's more answers to come and you can find those in two places. Let's do Dreams Come True, that's Steve's business, and you can find that at midwestsportplanes.com or you can reach out to, he's in Ohio, you can reach out to his partner on the East Coast, that's Art Tarola at abflight.com and you can find more about both of these airplanes and lots more affordable aircraft in the uh, light space on bydanjohnson.com.